questions of Emma Maris and Professor Chris Thomas. Emma Maris is a public intellectual of some renown, having published two books. Uh, one is Rambunctious Garden, and the other one more recently is Wild Souls. I haven't had an opportunity to look at Wild Souls yet, but Rambunctious Garden is a very eloquent exposition on biodiversity and what it means to uh, save nature in a post-wild world. And this is, of course, Wild Souls. And so in her work, there is an underlying theme, I think, of the question of wild and what it means in a human-dominated planet. Uh, Professor Chris Thomas is a long-time inmate of this institution and the current director of the Lieber Hume Center for Anthropocene and Biodiversity, which is where uh, I hail from as well as a fellow and several of the audience members too. <coughs> um, he is author of Inheritors of the Earth, which is in how nature is thriving in the age of extinction and uh, has some very maybe provocative views of biodiversity. Um, which we might get into today. Uh, so before we move into the discussion part of the talk, um, I'm just going to show of hands. How many people here think they have a good idea of what biodiversity is? Put your hands up. How many are maybe not so sure? Seems to be a cluster of notable skeptics in that corner. How many? maybe on the fence and say, like, I think I know, but maybe I'm open to some new ideas today. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So with, with that in mind, I'll turn it over to Chris and Emma with the first question. And maybe I'll let Emma answer that question first. Oh, how to define biodiversity? What is biodiversity? Yeah, so it's a great, I think it is a kind of a, bit, a more vexed question than we sometimes think. Um, the sort of most simple way to define it is just sort of what, how many different kinds of living things are there in this place or on, on this planet. Um, and if you look at uh, like sort of textbooks for undergraduates in conservation or ecology, they often have these kind of quite almost poetic definitions that go beyond just the number of species and include uh, the, how, are, how many different populations there are of a species and also the genetic diversity within uh, a population, but then all the way up to and including the different types of ecosystems or the different types of biomes. And then s recently I've noticed some textbooks also add in uh, an element of human relationship with, uh, with these sort of the diversity of human relationships with other species, which I think opens this uh, definition out into a kind of a, an incredibly broad potential concept. Um, however, in almost every sort of policy, it just means the number of species. Just one, two, three, four, how many species are there? Um, you know, if, uh, so often it's sort of instrumentalized, I would say, at the species level, even though sort of aspirationally it's a much broader and even sometimes sort of spiritual concept. Um, so I think it can really vary from case to case. And so when you encounter the word biodiversity, you have to sort of ask yourself, how, it's, how is it being used in this instance? Is this some law about the movement of species or endangered species in which it just means species, number of species, or is this some sort of you know, different application? Um, but, I, but I also think that the, it's an evolving concept over time, which makes it rich. Yes, and I agree entirely. Um, and it's become so widely used for so many things. Um, and meaning almost as an alternative for good yes. when thinking about the natural world. It's taken on a virtually godlike um, um, existence. Um, and so it then gets displayed in popular narratives as almost anything anyone wants in relation to the natural world. Um, and so you'll see, and I don't think this is appropriate use, you'll, you'll talk, you see people talking about the value of biodiversity and what have you got? You've got a panda or a polar bear on a lump of ice. It's one species or one individual sometimes of one species in one location. But this thing called biodiversity, there's this vague concept behind, is being pulled into the argument to explain why this thing I care about is so incredibly important. Um, but uh, Emma is quite right that it is typically reduced to the, when 
people are, uh, as scientists are studying biodiversity and uh, policy makers are trying to put together indexes to assess what's happening to biodiversity, it is often things like counts of the number of species or the average abundance of species through time. The difficulty with that is that and one of the sources of many arguments in the academic and also general discussions um, in society about biodiversity is that there isn't one count of species you should care for. I personally am quite care quite a bit for the number of species on the planet. Well, not actually the number because I can't possibly see and identify them all. So um, that that but one you can count the number of species on the planet, and an extinction of a species is one fewer on species on that list. On the other hand, on Heslington East campus here, we'll have a number of species, and or you might look at a, a plot of ground and say how many plant species have I got per square meter, and quite commonly people think about how many species are there in a country and and that's a kind of interesting one because we're, we're familiar with the idea that some species are going extinct and and many of us have great regrets about that but actually most species most countries today at least when it comes to plants have more species in, they, in them than they did a few hundred years ago. There was a, uh, a headline about the latest um, plant atlases in Britain um, a few weeks ago, expressed with huge regret because there are now more non-native species growing in Britain than there were um, than there are native species. What does that tell me? There's been a doubling of the plant biodiversity in Britain, there are now, if you just for a scientific metric, counting species, that's what's happened. So there's this, you can count the species in multiple different ways, then you can have them going up in some ways of count, going down in others, and there is no absolute single correct way to express these numbers. Um, and therefore it becomes a very challenging concept to operationalise in some policy framework. Right. I, I mean, that, that point, I think, is an interesting one. There are some species that are listed by the IUCN, for example, as extinct in the wild because they no longer are present in where they were considered to be native. But they might be present and living sort of freely somewhere else, like a camel in Australia. Uh, but because it's not, the camel in Australia isn't considered native there, it's not counted as part of biodiversity in Australia. It's seen as some sort of threat to biodiversity rather than a piece of biodiversity. And so on a global level, it's as if there are no camels, uh, you know, uh, but, um, but then on a local level, uh, there clearly are. You can see them walking across the desert. And so the question of whether native, uh, nativeness should fa figure into your counts of biodiversity is a very vexed one that we've both worked on. Yes, and if, just to give another British example, um, is uh, we now have two species of squirrel living wild in Britain. There used to be one. We've had a doubling of our squirrel biodiversity, but it's not infrequent, be it on spring watch or country file or whatever it might be, to hear the, the grey squirrel described as a major threat to British biodiversity. want to... Can you throw us some more questions sure. on that note? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm quite interested in that idea of nativeness. Um, the, the, uh, because it's quite common now where, where we have uh, uh, initiatives for rewilding, for de-extinction. Uh, you talk about it in your work. Uh, you know, where, what is the question of wild in that, in that concept? Or is, it, is a rewilded landscape like in Australia that involves feral camels? Um, uh, uh, a, 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 a new landscape or old landscape, what are we doing with that? So I guess this boils down to the question of, you know, of time and where we're coming from and where we're going. And uh, this is a feature in your book and this is a feature in Chris's who looks at very long time scales as well. Um, and I wonder what your thoughts are about, about this question of nativeness, about this question and how this relates to biodiversity dynamics over time. Who wants to shoot it down first? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is something that we've, you know, I think that we've sort of 
both looked at this with a skeptical eye, the idea that there is one list of species that are allowed to be in a place, and that anything that came after the day the list was made, or after 1500, or after the Romans, or whatever sort of date, that anything that then comes after that date is, is sort of not allowed in. Um, and I, I think that our, you know, we both of us began to question this sort of dogma quite a few years ago, but, but it's now becoming more common in the field to question this because in part of, because of climate change, right? So climate change is moving species, and there are great examples of species that are arriving uh, in the UK because it, the climate conditions have changed, and I think the spoonbill is an example of this. Um, so, you know, should the spoonbill be welcomed as a kind of a climate refugee that needs a place to thrive in a changing world, or should the spoonbill be repelled as, as an unpleasant invader that's going to only contaminate the, the ecosystem? Um, I tend to think, and I think Chris agrees with me, that, that species have always moved around. They have, that's, I mean, there was a big glacier over most of this island, right? And and everything had to... Uh, Badger Hill, just over there, is the, is the end. end of the glacial yeah. moraine. Um, it was up and then leading onto a lake in the Vale of York. This was uh, an environment at the edge of the ice uh, a mere 20 odd thousand years ago. And 20,000 years might sound a bit of a time ago for two most people, um, but Actually, in terms of the evolution of biodiversity and the history of life on Earth, it's just a minuscule short period of time. So essentially, all of the species that we've got here, all of the communities of the things that we consider native, but just you wander out for five minutes, essentially everything that you will see has arrived since that time, that mainly in the last 11,500 years ago since the beginning of the so-called Holocene period, the, the warm period that started there. So that is how the biological world, how biodiversity, if we can use that what term, that's how it deals with environmental change. And, and that's why we've had the ecosystems we have and the biological communities. And now, of course, the challenge is that as things change again, because we're changing the climate this time, or we're doing all sorts of other things to the planet, when species move again and make new communities, should we um, say, well, this is fine. This is the way biological diversity rides the environmental bumps that come along. Or is it something that we should be trying to somehow prevent? Yeah, yeah. So I have a question for you then about that. What about the rate of change? You talked about the past 20,000 years being the blip in evolutionary geological time scales. Right? But right now in the Anthropocene, with a, with, a, with a dominant human driver of change, is there is there a difference in, in how we should look at biodiversity dynamics uh, given the speed of changes we're forcing on the planet? I'm what? interested in your answer to this, right? Because I think philosophically, if if it's okay for uh, a species to come across the channel 11,000 years ago, then I don't see a difference about it coming across now. But this rate of change question, like, is it possible that somehow because the rate has increased, it's a different ball game? I don't know. What do you? Well, it's very very complicated, and the. Um, the interacting combinations of changes we're inflicting on the world is truly altering the planet's biological world and the diversity of species, where species live, what the communities look like. There's no doubt about that. It's happening very fast. Um, so, And it's it happening is, within one human lifetime, which means that we have to deal with that on an emotional level as well. It's not just this thing we study in the fossil yeah, record. It's like but, you look but, out the window and there's different species than there were when you were a kid, and that can, that can feel very challenging. But I don't think we have to have those emotions. In the sense that, in in the sense that, in the sense that, why couldn't we all figure out that the way that species, populations, biodiversity as a whole deals with environmental change is itself to change and move, and therefore why don't we get behind helping it to do so more? In other words, to if if we concerned about the negative aspects of human modification 
of biodiversity, can we actually give it a fillip, a helping hand to adjust to the new environment? And of course, the classic sort of example is if you have got an endangered species of Narcissus daffodil growing on top of one or a couple of, um, of mountain tops in Spain, then why not grow those in rural Britain rather than the standard garden varieties to give these things a potential option to live in a new part of the world that they would not be able to reach on their own. I think you're wanting to a little, have your cake and eat it too a little bit because you're wanting to tell people that they shouldn't feel the sad emotions about change, but you want to now leverage their, their happy emotions about biodiversity in order to get them to help you. I don't it. want to do anything. People okay. can do what they want. <laughs> I mean, I think we have to reckon with, reckon with the sort of sense of loss and grief around change, as well as the sense of enthusiasm or excitement we might have about being part of a kind of an ad adaptive process. I don't think that we can tell people what to feel. No, no. And, and so I, 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 I think actually in the book I do put my cards on the table reasonably and say, well, um, given that everything moves, I'm not particularly concerned personally, and others are, as you quite rightly say, um, um, about exactly what is in a particular location yeah. and what the exact relative abundances of each of the species are that are present in a particular location. What I'm caring about more is the keeping global. the global species going because those are, if you like, in a dynamic world, those are the building blocks, if you like, of future ecological communities. So to a first approximation, every future com ecological community, let's say 200 years in the hence, and God knows what we'll have done to the planet by then, um, that, but every ecological community, we think, will still be constructed from the descendants of today's species, mm -hmm. even if they're in different places and different abundances. And that's my kind of inner logic, but I accept that it's, uh, it's probably deeply flawed, but is my personal logic for focusing on trying to keep as many of those building blocks of ecological communities in play as possible. Yeah. Well, I think I agree with you that I ultimately care the most about that global level of biodiversity and that I do think it's really helpful for me emotionally to sort of tell myself that change is sometimes other species adapting to what we've done to them rather than just always a negative bad outcome. Um, but I think it's also the case that, that, that part of the reason that we value nature is because of our relationships with it and that insofar as species move around so that we break some of those relationships, that some of the things that we used to gather and eat as kids are no longer there, that, that, that can, we can admit that those are things that make us feel sad. Oh yes, I've got a log I, I have a logic. Whether I behave according to this logic yes, is an yeah. entirely different sure thing. Of course species. I love lots of things and species that I've got some kind of affection, familiarity with, might have worked on at some time in the, in the past. And, mm -hmm. and of course I, I, I kind of love many things in the natural world. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I'm sure I'm hypocritical the entire time. But I would nonetheless think that if we're trying to develop sort of national and global conservation yes. strategies, then, then trying to think, well, what ultimately is this thing that we most want to focus on keeping in some way? So I think, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there, there, there's, there's, a, there's a question for my mind that, that, that you're both touching on here. And, and as a social scientist, I really appreciated your point about how it feels as an individual to see change happening in a place you recognize and know. Um, that can be profoundly disturbing. Um, and e even something from Canada, and seeing the wildfires there and having spent a lot of time in the boreal forest like that, and in the cities that are affected by the smoke, I can feel that impact. That is a change, and it's an adverse change that's happening. Um, but uh, uh, so that, that sense of place that people have and how they think places should be is very, very important. And one of, uh, there's a question here about how that translates into people's attitudes and behaviors towards certain types of uh, environmental projects, something like conservation of certain kinds of biodiversity, 
preferences for certain sorts of organisms they think are important or are marketed that way, that kind of thing, the way they respond to initiatives in their own backyard. Uh, for example, are they supporting the construction of a new development over forest, over farmland, or something like that? It, it, how, what sort of environmental projects do they participate in? And I think something that we're all very familiar with right now is rewilding and de-extinction. Uh, this is a very common uh, uh, idea. Uh, it's common in the UK. It's, it's in North America now, too. There are people trying to create mammoths uh, out of, out of you know, fragments of DNA dug up in the tundra. So, so where does this fit in? That, 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 that both that preserving the now, but also maybe even reconstructing some past ideal ecosystem or an individual organism that was understood to be part of an ecosystem that no longer exists. How does this fit into this idea of biodiversity and, and, and so on? I have lots of thoughts, but you can go ahead and start it. Uh, well, I was, just, I was just going to say that that in terms of the de-extinction of trying to get fragments of DNA and say with the mammoth, the idea is you get bits of uh, de ancient DNA that have dug out of the permafrost in Siberia. You fuse it with Indian elephant DNA, uh, Indian elephants and mammoths, but the, their closest relatives. Um, and then you create something that is effectively a mammoth type thing. But why are we doing it? Well, partly because can we? I'll be the first person on the plane to go and see this mammoth-like creature if it comes into existence. Um, but also I think that there's a sense of guilt. If we think that this is something we, humanity, whatever that is, at some point in the past are responsible for doing away with, then it's we humans should now take the action responsibility to, to put it back. So I think that a lot of those choices are born and indeed when things decline, it, certain species that were common in a particular place decline, even if they're fine elsewhere, it is often the sense that we're responsible and it's a guilt that is making us trying to do something to turn the world clock back. Yeah, I, I agree that guilt is a big part of it. I mean, to me, it seems like it's all born out of this sort of fundamental error, which is this idea that humans are not na natural or not part of nature, that we're somehow outside of it. So that everything that we've done to affect ecosystems is by definition negative and bad, and that conservation is ultimately about restoring this Edenic pre-human state. Um, and 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 I think conservation sort of operated with this kind of ill-defined Edenic pre-human state in North America and in other colonized places for many years, just assuming that the Eden was the day before the first colonists showed up, and that that the goal of conservation was to get back to that time well, point. We talked about the first European. Colonists. Yep, first we're first white guy off the boat. That's your baseline, um, and that's sort of essentially how conservation has worked in North America for for decades. But then the more we learned about this sort of place to see an extinction and, and what, you know, that maybe people had had something to do with these ground sloths and these giant saber cats and these mastodons going extinct, there became this idea of like, oh, well, if we're going to be consistent about this, now we have to go back before we messed up all that stuff. Uh, we as humans more broadly, and we have to recreate this sort of place to see an Eden. Um, which it, it starts to become more and more absurd because if you go back to the day before humans arrived in North America, you're going to run into that same glacier that we've got at the end of the moraines here. You know, there's, there's really, it's really a different universe. All of the species were in different places. There was tundra where there's now forests, and there were all these other species. Recreating that world is is uh, it's, it's as if this sort of initial error of thinking that we have to go back to the day before people has spiraled out of control. And now we're in this kind of Pleistocene fantasy land. Um, I, so that's where I see this, this kind of impulse coming from, that it's, that it's this sort of collective guilt of many thousands of years of human impacts. Now, having said all that, I do find it interesting on some level. And, and, and although I think if I was you know, god of conservation, I would take all that money away from the de-extinction people and give it immediately to the people who are just doing the kind of like much more unglamorous work of, <coughs> of trying to do on the ground conservation for less glamorous things. I'm still going to be watching it with quite a bit of interest as it, as it takes place, you know, because I think it, it will happen because 
the kind of people who are m interested in it are the kind of people who have the checkbooks to make it happen. So I think it's it's going to happen to some extent. Yeah. Um, the the technologies are developing. It will get there, whether that's in two years, twenty years, or or a hundred years, but there will be some of these, and there is also the argument that people have put forward that the money that's coming in for the extinction it's project is not actually yeah. competing with other conservation funds. Because it's sort of tech bro kind of yeah. money. Yeah. So, I mean, given that we've got so many species are in trouble at the moment, however, as species, of course, it, it seems to me a little bit ludicrous yeah. to uh, for example, in New Zealand, to try and bring back the huya bird. These are these incredible ones, whether I can't remember which way the genders work. One's got a pointy bill for pecking stuff out, and then one's got a curved bill for getting grubs out of the holes that have been made. Um, Is this the one with the black feather with the white tip that was yes. in all of the. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and it dress. has all sorts of cultural significance. But it died out because of rats and various other. Um, issues in New Zealand. So it doesn't seem to be a vast amount of point in trying to bring it back right now until, until actually you can de rat significant fractions yeah. of New Zealand. It's got to play, otherwise, you're just generating a new conservation a challenge, problem. crisis, costs. When if you can reconstruct these things, well, you'll be able to do it an awful lot more easily in 100 years than you can, time than you can now. So there's no kind of urgency. But there are plenty of large mammals on the planet, for example, where at least most people I talk to seem to be pretty convinced they're almost exclusively gone extinct because in the last 55, 60,000 years because people killed them faster than they could, could reproduced. And in that circumstance, the, they're potentially perfectly viable animals if we could bring them back because we just have to decide we're not going to kill them any longer. And yeah, but then, you also need to figure out where they're going to live and oh, yeah, who's yeah, yeah. legally responsible for them. I didn't them. say it was a trivial um, <laughs> I agree. No. I agree. I mean, so, so from virtually all respects, it's not a top priority. Yeah. On the other hand, um, I think it would be totally and amazingly fascinating to see European forests with straight tusks elephants in again mm. well, and rhinos. two species of rhino yeah. so right now in Europe we would have one species of elephant and two species of rhinoceros if it wasn't for us exterminating them and hippos so it's 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 maybe very hyenas. tempting yeah. yeah of course of course if you live in um, let's say looking at Hannah over there rural Spain <laughs> and um, and Someone you wants to put suge uh, suggest yeah. putting the whole caboodle straight back onto their, yeah. onto their farm. They might be slightly less than amused. And my prediction is, just to sort of prepare you for the era to come, is that there will be claims that this has been accomplished, but with very low levels of sort of genetic difference, so that they'll have some elephant that's just got kind of like a sort of curly, hairy vibe, and they'll be like, it's a mammoth, and then somebody else will be like, no, it's not a mammoth, and then 20 years later, they'll have a slightly more plausible looking, I don't think it's gonna be like one day we open the paper, well, ha, open the paper, it shows my age right there, but one day we look at the news and it says the mammoths are back. There's gonna be all these intermediate kind of claims and forms and we're going to have to figure out how to, whether to treat them as endangered animals or whether to treat them as weird pets and it's going to be a whole yeah, mess. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting one because if you think of the North American bison, yeah. which um, for years people were trying to get them, it was very difficult apparently, but they were trying to cross them with, um, with cattle so that you could get an animal that would could live on the sort of rough forage that bison used in, in sort of remoter areas of North America, uh, but would be easy enough to herd, as in cattle. And also have a meatier rump. You know, bison have a really skinny butt. There's not that much meat on them. And, and so now most, uh, if not all, of the bison populations that survive in North America have got a soupçon of cattle in yeah. them. And the moment one of them is born that looks a little bit too cow-like, um, there's a tendency for them to be removed. From, from any the, conservation herds. Yeah. yeah, from, yeah. Most, most bison in the, in the U.S. are actually commercially raised food bison, um, which, which have quite a bit of cattle genes in them, but the ones that they have at like Yellowstone and other sort of conservation herds, 
they get extremely kind of intensely purist about trying to get the cattle genes out in a way that I think maybe misses the forest for the trees. Yeah, and and in one particular place, um, um, just north of the um, Grand Canyon, um, where the ca the these slightly hybrid animals, uh, but mainly bison, were um, eating the vegetation. Goodness me, why would a bison or cow eat vegetation? But they did. And so um, it was regarded as a negative effect on the vegetation um, because, because, they were uh, because there, but there was a hint of cow in yeah. them. I mean, we're whereas literally talking elsewhere, between like one and three percent of, but of yeah, cow genes. Whereas elsewhere, which is a similar to the amount of Neanderthal that most of us have in our yeah. genomes. Um, so we should exterminate anyone who looks a little bit too Neanderthal-like <laughs> right away. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, so that's. But, but in other herds are being encouraged and introduced to other areas because the grazing and browsing will be beneficial. Right, right. And so, so, the, so there's this sort of framing of it, um, which is all a bit weird. Uh, a few questions around this now. Um, so so what, what, what are the, going back to the of rats in New Zealand and um, questions about extinction, uh, what is the difference between an invasive species and a species that's adapting to changes. And should we, for example, if a species is threatened in a certain area, relocate that species to a new area where it might thrive? And is that different from what we understand as an, as an invasive species? Hmm. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, it's a real problem in the context of climate change. If the world wasn't changing, then the approach to conservation and the maintenance of the world's biodiversity that works would quite rationally be, let's try and keep everything doing OK where it is today. And that was more or less the construct of conservation, whilst carefully sidestepping the fact that people had already, for tens of thousands of years, been altering the vegetation. So, that then is a real problem. Um, yeah, I've lost the train there. Go yeah, for it. I mean, <laughs> so I don't use the term invasive species. I think it's far too too value laden. You know, it it it, it suggests, for one thing, that these species have ill intent themselves. That they are sort of are like, all right, men, let's get on the boat and go invade. You know, and um, which. Uh, which you might laugh at, but then sometimes you see the way that, that people talk about invasive animals and also the ways that people kill invasive animals that are often quite a bit less humane than the way people would be legally allowed to kill a, a native species. Um, and the idea that your sort of place of origin means that it's okay to kill you in more horrible ways, I find uh, very troubling because, of course, none of these plants or animals know where their what their passport says or you know where they're supposed to be they were born on New Zealand you know from their they consider it their home and so um, I do think that it leads us to some sort of ethically tricky waters um, the scale of killing of animals in conservation is not trivial um, in island systems is you know systems up to and including the size of Australia introduced predators are considered to be like a major, major threat to species, and so millions of them are killed every year through trapping, shooting, poisoning. Um, and so the question of whether these, these deaths are always justifiable, especially in a world where ecosystems are changing rapidly and, and the new combinations of species might work better or be more quote unquote resilient than old, uh, more familiar combinations of species, I think it can be very troubling. Um, or at least we should, you know, what I always say is we should at least ask questions first and shoot later. You know, we shouldn't necessarily immediately reach for the lethal control when something is non-native. We should at least sort of say, okay, is this thing going to imminently cause the extinction? And if so, then we can start having a conversation about how to control. So, as you know, I'm going to ask you a question here, which is, you know, is not the question that I would 
necessarily ask, mm -hmm. but I'm going to ask on behalf of an invasive species biologist mm. and say, ah, yes, but we know that if something turns up somewhere, the best thing to do is to get rid of it instantly because it, it won't be very long before we haven't got enough bullets around to be able to get rid of the problem given that it will grow. Um, and therefore, they take a what they would regard as a risk-averse, precautionary. precautionary approach. Yeah. I actually have a lot of sympathy for that view because although most introduced species do not cause major uh, ecological problems or uh, threaten extinction, some of them clearly do. And in in New Zealand is a great example where flightless birds are are relatively helpless against rats and and uh, stoats and other introduced predators. So if I'm working at the new Department of DOC in, in New Zealand and somebody says, oh, with new mammal predator has just arrived on our shores, should we kill it? I would probably say yes, let's, let's, let's maybe nip that one in the bud. But if I'm working in a big continental national park and they say, oh, a new you know, annual plant has just showed up, should we kill it? And now I'm a little less sure because if you look at the data, a bunch of, uh, it's much less likely that some introduced annual plant is gonna lead to some sort of global extinction event. So I think that you have to be extremely case by case on this stuff. Yes, and recent reviews in the scientific literature of which species, I think they're focusing on species of vertebrate, are endangered by invasive species, that is to say species that have arrived from a different part of the world, is that they tend to be in particular circumstances. On the one hand, oceanic islands. On the other hand, um, lakes that contain fish that are like endemic. Watery only, islands. Uh, which are land. effectively, exactly, they are the, the, on land, the sort of mirror image of islands and the ocean. Mm -hmm. And that the responsible species that are doing the endangering is for someone will correct me in a minute because I'm not sure the quite, but I think it's more than three quarters of all of those endangerments are caused by about 10 to 15 mm. invasive species, at least in the vertebrate mm. world. And so it isn't about, oh, it's a foreign thing, help, let's get rid of it, it's actually, is it a rat? Is it a rat? Is, is yeah. it a whatever, <laughs> yeah. it, whatever it else it is? Is it a rat? Or is it one of those on species of ants on rat, in some cat, environments? Fox, yeah. mouse. Yeah. And, and so, and, and it, I believe, remains more or less true that after decades of study, one of the best um, predictors of whether a species turning up in a new part of the world is going to cause what people perceive to be as harm to the native species is, has it already done so already somewhere and else. somewhere else in the world? And so it's not like, given that the climate is changing, that the response of the majority of species today is that they are moving their geographic distributions and that actually enables them to survive. So us as people trying to put a stop on this does A is impossible, B doesn't make any sort of biological sense. And it can actually be actively counterproductive, right? Because yeah. when you when a new species shows up in a new environment, there is a period of time often in which it does quite well because all the other species in that environment are like, what is this? I don't know how to eat it, or I don't know how to stop it from eating me. But after, if they become quite abundant, they represent a large pool of energy. And so then all the other species in that environment now has a pretty high incentive to figure out how to tap into that pool of energy. So if you're a new tree species and you show up in a place uh, and you become quite abundant, all the tree eating insects who figure out how to eat you are gonna do really well. And so by continuing to cut down the introduced trees, we kind of stop this almost sort of predictable boom bust cycle where they become quite abundant and then somebody figures out how to eat them. Um, I, when I was writing my book, I went back to uh, one of the first, pre the person who sort of popularized this notion of invasive species and using these sort of military metaphors around species movements was a biologist who I actually really have a lot of love for, named Charles Elton. Um, and he wrote this book in the 1950s uh, about this. And I went back to the book and I looked at his examples and like half of them or more, I don't have exact data, 
I had never even heard of these species as being problematic. And when I tried to find out, like, well, what had happened to this plant that everyone was freaking out about in the 1950s, you could see the news articles about how it's going to eat the canals or it's going to, you know, conquer everything. And then all of a sudden, the news articles just sort of trail off, and you never hear about it again. And we don't write it. When, when these um, boom-bust cycles go into their bust period, the media is, uh, I take full responsibility as a member of the media. Nobody writes the article about how actually um, things, it didn't manage to eat the countryside. Um, so I think that there's a, a level at which our attention to how things move around is, is always focused on loss. It's a very psychological thing, loss and endangerment. And, and we miss the other part of it, which is that it gets naturalized, this old concept from botany. So whatever our personal feelings might be about the changes, we can't stop them. And actually, you could slow some of them down. I'm sure. Some of them, yeah. But but a few vertebrates, a few what? I mean, yeah. yeah the, we can't. You know, there's millions of species out there. We yeah. can't really. Um, we can't micromanage how the biological world, this biodiversity, responds to the overall environmental changes. And it would be what, arrogant of us to try. I think we know better. It's completely bonkers to think <laughs> that humans are some, you know, over the, the tens, hundreds, even millions of years of life, ecosystems have managed to assemble themselves perfectly well, thank you very much, without humans doing a little sort of um, um, tinkering with them to make sure they work Now, to be better. fair, that, there's extinctions that happen along the way when, during that process. Oh, yeah, so. yeah, 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 and there will be. And, um, and the present period, I mean, the, the, the footnote is in a, in my, of my book is in a time of extinction, and that, that is right because the environment is changing extremely rapidly and it is absolute that some things already haven't made it and there are still things that are not going to make it. But trying to bottle the world as it is now yeah. and blame and, and tar everything that's moving with the brush because there's a handful of really problematic species that when they move do alter ecosystems um, doesn't make much sense to me. So I'm just aware of the time. Uh, we're just about up, uh, but uh, the couple housekeeping notes, and then I have one more question for you. Uh, so we have an audio-visual event downstairs in the exhibition room, uh, which is 004, which might give you a sense of how landscapes change over time. Wait, so this is the your your yeah. thing? Oh, I'm so excited so, about this. You so should all go. You, you should all go. So, so unfortunately, we have a problem with the lights. Some of the lights in the room don't actually turn off, so the full effect might not be apparent. But, uh, but we, we, we'll manage. Um, uh, and that's that's uh, been put together, uh, led by Chantal Berry, who's a PhD student in our center and myself. Um, but the question I have uh, is uh, for you both. If you had one or two things that audience members should remember when thinking about biodiversity going forward, what would that be? Go ahead. It's dynamic. Yeah. All of the ecological and evolutionary processes every single one of them that gives rise to all of the biological diversity we see in a particular place in the planet, including us as part of it, arise from these dynamic processes of ecology and evolution. So the one thing that we should not do is to try and treat it as a thing, a static thing that we try to keep as it always, as it was, and as, have, as as people phrase, as it should be. Mm -hmm. There is no should to be in the dynamics of the natural world. Yeah, well, you sort of stole my, my idea there. But I'll add to that, which is you know, that, that when we're looking at changes, they can feel extremely uncomfortable. And I, too, share that discomfort. And I think that sort of just taking a, a moment to try to distinguish just change itself, some of which may be adaptation of other species from loss is really helpful. Some of the stuff around us is clearly loss, but some of the things that are happening around us is actually 
change that will lead towards future biodiversity. Um, so that's helped me. Uh, when the hummingbird showed up in Seattle, my mother was furious at these interlopers that had just showed up from California. And she found them to be like, they gave her a sense of dread every time she looked at them because they were like this symbol that everything was falling apart and, and it wasn't the way it should be. And so I bought her a hummingbird feeder. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's what I would have you take away, is to, to think about uh, the difference between loss and change. Uh, we probably have a few minutes for questions. Uh, if anybody in the audience has a question, their hands are already up. Uh, let's start there. Okay, thanks. Um, enjoyed it very much. Uh, <clears throat> just picking up on a couple of things, you were talking about uh, you know, the, the prejudice against non-native species. And uh, then went on to talk about species turning up in various places. Well, of course, one of the reasons for prejudice is that species don't just turn up, they are introduced by humans in various contexts, uh, sometimes just because uh, they're a good source of food. But often uh, there was a kind of period where there was a kind of bioengineering going on. And Various things were introduced to control other things right. that were regarded as a nuisance. And that often was disastrous. You know, think of the cane toads in Australia. And uh, there are various other examples of that uh, where you know, we thought we would outsmart the ecosystem and it turned out we practically wrecked it. One thing I'd say about that, which is it's true, I, I, I tell is that there are actually lots of interesting cases of successful biocontrol introductions, and nobody ever hears about them for that same media bias reason that I alluded to earlier. For example, dung beetles were introduced to Australia to deal with all of the livestock uh, waste. And they, they did well, they, thr they thrive, and they take care of all the livestock waste, and they roll up little balls, and everybody's happy, and uh, you never hear about it. Uh, so there's a bit of a, you know, what do we pay attention to there? But I'd also say that that there's no real scientific way to tell whether a certain species arose in a, it like showed up because someone brought it or because it was like attached to a bird foot or something. Uh, ecologically speaking, they operate uh, pretty much the same no matter how they got there. And if humans are an animal that's part of nature, the idea that whether we were involved in the transit of a species doesn't seem to matter to me as much as just what the species does once it gets there. <coughs> yeah, um, I just wondered what your thoughts are on Himalayan balsa. I love this. Every time I go to talk, everyone will be like, "This conceptually, I love this idea, but what about species X? Because it's the worst." Because we're told whenever we see. I'm happy to do Himalayan balsa. Yeah, you do Himalayan balsa. <coughs> you know, so I was I was trained properly. I I mean I I hated every species that came from outside Britain once. Um, and um, so Himalayan balsam, well, what are you going to do about it? It's widespread. Beekeepers love it because it's a good source of nectar late in, late in the year. It grows up from seeds. Um, so actually, it's not. There, there's very weak evidence that it has much impact on the rest of the you know, driving other species out. In fact, where I have it at home, main things it's driving out are nettles and brambles. So I'm not so upset about that. So I just. Uh, and its distribution is everywhere. We can't, we can't control it. Um, and it's restricted to moist habitats. And where I've got it, in a very wet year, it'll expand slightly. A dry year, it dies back again. It's not about to march across the rest of the countryside and stop it. And so I kind of made my own personal judgment, which you may all disagree with, but that doesn't matter for what I'm going to say, that, uh, that actually it wasn't really particularly problematic. It was just another species doing its thing. Um, but I was well trained to pull Himalayan balsam up whenever I saw it, because it's this bad, invasive thing. After I came to the conclusion it wasn't a problem at home, it took me about five years before I could stop myself automatically <laughs> flexing to pull the thing out, because I'd got neurons still operating in the background there that had to kill this thing. Um, so just be patient with your consideration of these foreign things. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, it's really interesting. Um, and just on your wrap-up comments, th there was a sort of, we can't do much about this, this is all, uh, I, 
I think the way you wrapped it up sat slightly oddly with me with the fact that humans are by far and away the greatest influence <coughs> on all biodiversity anywhere in the planet, and that wasn't true before. So there's something that's different now. So I, I just wondered what your thoughts on I, I, what you're not saying is just step back. We can't no. do anything about this. No, no. Because we should look at our own actions as humans and what plastics we buy or how we our drive or all these other things, which are huge drivers of loss and damage. That's an excellent point. Um, I don't think that we should just be like, well, let's who know, let, let, let everybody else sort it out. You know, um, I, I, I don't think that's what either of us would say. Um, sir, I think that there are, there's a case to be made that we've made here for letting some ecosystems uh, be more autonomous and not feel as if we have to manage them back to some sort of previous condition. But most, but this is, we're discussing now just a tiny fraction of the landscape, the sort of places that we manage for sort of other species. Most of the landscape we're managing for agriculture, for uh, urban and peri-urban, you know, for all these other things. And in those places, we could do a much better job at <coughs> managing those landscapes so that our continued effects on all of the rest of the species are, are considerably lessened. And that, what Chris has been working on quite a bit recently. So, you're completely right, of course. It's uh, that ultimately it's the evolution of humans, the, everything what we manage to do technologically, the growth of our population and consumption. The difficulty is that it's not going away anytime soon. Um, and most of the per capita increases in consumption rate, for example, of food are happening in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Southern Asia where increased nutrition is still most desirable that it actually happens. And so um, I think one of the, so, so the change is inevitable and we've got to pick our fights, I would argue, as to what we really most care about and also have some chance of being winnable. But ultimately, I think in the conservation world, there is a big confusion between, let's say, cause and effect. Because if you look at the uh, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, red lists of species, the most common listed um, endangerment, cause of endangerment is land use change, much of it to produce, most of it to produce food, and intensification of land that had already been converted. And the problem is there that we probably need one and a half times to two, two times as much food in 40 to 50 years as now. And so we need to tackle the food production system if we really want to reverse the uh, overall trends. Um, and I would say and climate about change that. too. I mean, we should yeah, all be doing all the climate change, change yeah, things. Absolutely. You know, that's just sort of a given, right? Like yeah. we should be immediately switching over to a completely zero carbon yeah. e economy, and we should be doing a lot of work to completely overhaul the food system. All of these things, what it is it, it, like technically possible to create more room on the planet for other species, and then I think what they do with that room. Uh, we should leave, at least in some places, up to them, and so sort of thinking that we know better. Does that make sense? But in conservation, we should pro I would argue we should tackle the underlying causes, such as stopping climate change, such as changes in food production yeah. systems, more, put more effort in there, and slightly less emphasis on trying to patch up the consequences of those major global drivers. Yeah, like a huge percentage of conservation papers are about like how to manage these little tiny reserves where we have like 15 orangutans and like that's all well and good, but we need to like change the way the entire planet eats and that is what will really help. It always comes back to agriculture. And that would be an excellent topic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, before I say thank you to the speakers, I just want to have a quick show of hands. Uh, has anybody's uh, answers to the questions asked at the beginning changed over the course of this talk? <laughs> Has, do you think you have an idea of what biodiversity is? No? Better one? Uh, has your idea of biodiversity changed over this hour? No? Awesome. Are you more confused? Are you, are you more confused? <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Emma and I are completely confused We're very as to what biodiversity is. You know, you can be friends with us. <laughs> so, so, so with that, I'd like to say thank you to our speakers, Emma Maris and Chris Thomas, uh, for a very informative and, and engaging hour.
Uh, and we have a quick round of applause.